Greetings. My name is Logan. I am representing group three today. My other teammates who are not here are Lily and Lisa, and we are presenting the topic of sex offenders, psychology, implications, and remediation. Warning, as we continue, this topic can be sensitive and difficult for some, so take the steps that you need in order for this to be acceptable for you, whatever those may be. Moving on to the presentation. Shaping the problem. The capital loss of sex offenses nationally is staggering. Alone, tangible costs incurred to victims of rape was estimated in 1969 to exceed $125 billion annually. Notably, this figure does not include the costs of judicial processes. If it, was, if it did, it'd be much greater. This is just the cost to the victims. Healthcare also suffers massively, with associated costs of sex offense representing 37.5% of total national healthcare spending. Described by some as an incontrovertible healthcare epidemic, the CDC estimates that one in four girls and one in 13 boys will become sexually abused before the age of 18, suggesting long-lasting personal, financial, and societal costs if the problem goes unmitigated. Importantly, before finding solutions, problems must be understood. Regarding the ideology of sex offense and remediation, developing understanding is immensely difficult. Confounding variables, obscure research findings, and current government interventions are suboptimally effective, providing temporary benefit while potentially even exacerbating circumstances for the socioeconomically disadvantaged, for example. Imprisonment and offender registry. More than 144,000 child sex offenders are estimated to be imprisoned at the state and federal level alone, costing taxpayers roughly $5.5 billion annually. Comparably, in 2021, the federal budget for research preventing child sexual abuse was insignificant, amounting to 1.5 million, not billion, million. Imprisoning sex offenders represents one means by which social damages caused by sex offenders is mitigated. Although imperfect, imprisonment effectively alleviates potential further damages sex offenders may otherwise inflict on society, albeit temporarily. Mitigative effects of imprisonment extending with certainty only for the duration of sentencing. Moreover, once prisoners are released, the majority are rearrested, with 12 to 24 percent of these rearrests relating to sex offenses. Superficially, it may appear that the results of imprisonment significantly reduce the rate of abuse once sex offenders fulfill their sentence. However, re-victimizations are likely much greater with estimates suggesting that only 310 of every 1,000 sexual assaults are reported, of which only 50 actually lead to arrest. Additional legislative interventions include, for example, the Jacob Wetterling Act, Megan's Law, and the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act nationally requiring publicly available registration of sex offenders as well as the abused. Socially, such registrations have the effect of, in part, ostracization, undermining social ties that may otherwise enforce non-abusive behaviors of the sex offenders. Regarding policy, many states use sex offender registries to enforce laws restricting sex offenders living near vulnerable areas, such as schools and playgrounds. Consequently, concentrating sex offender register residents to more disadvantaged areas, potentially facilitating continued victimization. Health and prosperity. Childhood sexual assault can have far reaching consequences into adulthood, economically, socially, psychologically, parentally, and behaviorally. Importantly, parsing precisely the causal factors contributing to later life outcomes is difficult fundamentally because each factors intrinsic mutual influence on other aspects of life. Note, the findings we'll discuss largely suggest generalizations describing the population of sexual crime victims as a whole, with other research suggesting and finding tremendous contextual variability between abuse survivors. More than their non-abused female counterparts, females with child sexual abuse histories demonstrate lessened crystallized and fluid cognition, potentially resulting from active psychological defenses such as disassociation. Over the course of their lives, they are at greater risk for depression and PTSD, qualifying for at least one DSM diagnosis. Notably, such effects may also play a role later in later economic outcomes, with abused victims being more likely to drop out of high school, demonstrating worse performance at work, and ultimately experiencing reduced 
earnings over their lifetime. An outcome exacerbated by increased rate of medical visits, major illness, and hospitalization. Unfortunately, victims of sex abuse also appear to live lives associated with the trajectories of those associated with chronic illness, consequences of, rich promo consequences of which promoting greater possibility of falling into poverty due to increased medical costs. Environmental. Importantly, women with child sexual abuse histories also have greater likelihood of teenage pregnancy and to give birth prematurely, both representing outcomes associated with adverse effects later in life for their children. Combined with the effects mentioned previously, the environment sex abuse, sex abuse survivors tend to inhabit may bode poorly for optimal recovery, often resulting in contexts with greater risk of spousal abuse, content, continued sexual abuse, drug and alcohol abuse, and risky sexual behavior. Socioeconomically, this appears as a life characterized by instability both financially and socially, adversely affecting social support networks and broadening the gap of their own and their children's access to resources. Ideological. Particularly, the magnitude of the problem clarifies when we look at the effects of sex abuse intergenerationally. It has been estimated that 30% of child sexual abuse survivors go on to abuse their own children in adulthood, with clear distinctions of abuse towards minors committed disproportionately more often by survivors of child sexual abuse than by those abused only in their adulthood. In part, the problem appears to precipitate through learning, as sex offenders with child sexual abuse histories often abuse children in a manner similar to the abuses they themselves experienced in their own childhood. Importantly, the connection between history of child sexual abuse and subsequent commitment of sexual abuse is not definitive. Contributing factors enveloping the emergence of sex offenses are mutually interactive. It is unlikely that history of child sexual abuse alone leads to victims later committing sexual abuse. Intergenerational. Moreover, regardless of sexual abuse experience, Children born to mothers with histories of abuse shoulder a cumulative burden, demonstrating emotionally, psychological, and cognitive impairment and reduced physical well-being. Exacerbated by psychological ramifications of sex abuse histories, the stresses of parenthood can leave mothers less emotionally and physically available, resulting in more permissive parenting styles characterized by reduced ability to enforce appropriate levels of discipline. Moreover, Mothers with child sexual abuse histories can negatively affect their children through their own heightened anxieties, depression, poor self-perception, and discomfort, discomfort with intimacy, such as healthy, close physical contact. Their children demonstrating, in addition to the aforementioned, extreme attachment strategies typified by anxiety. In sum, due to the contexts they are born into, many factors surrounding child the child collaborate to their disadvantage, burdening upward socioeconomic and developmental trajectories, paving the way toward such contexts, contexts that may provide impetus for the continuation of abusive intergenerational cycles. Ideological theories on sex offenders, childhood abuse. Victim to victimizer theory argues that exposure to sexual abuse as a child leads to reenactment of that abuse on victims as the abuser. Research has had mixed results, but a meta-analysis by Jesperson et al. in 2009 did suggest that sexual offenders against adults more were more likely to have been physically abused as children, while sexual offenders against children were more likely to have been sexually abused as children. Additional research by Simons et al. in 2002 studies a lack of empathy in the etiology and maintenance of the sexual offender population and hypothesized the childhood abuse and lack of empathy towards their own needs and feelings as children decreased their ability to empathize with their victims. Many researchers conclude that adult sexual offending can result from a combination of adverse childhood experiences, including physical and sexual abuse, witnessing family violence, as well as early exposure to pornography. It is important to note that there are many limitations in the research on childhood abuse theories, and most people who are not abused as children do not become sex offenders in adulthood. Theories continued, sexual misinterpretation. 
Several studies have linked misperception of sexual intent with sexual assault. In a 1993 study by Shea, college men were screened on prior sexual coercion perpetration and then examined on their perception of a female lab partner's behavior towards them. Previously sexually coercive men were more likely to believe that their lab partner was behaving in a sexually interested way than men with no history. In a 2087 study by Abby, two thirds of college students surveyed felt that their friendliness had been misinterpreted. Alcohol consumption is another huge factor, as studies show that those who commit sexual assaults are more likely to believe it was consens consensual while under the influence of alcohol. Gender-related cognitions. This would be the most well-studied factor in sexual assault-related research because sexual assault is widely regarded as hostility and a desire to dominate the opposite sex. As women are sexually assaulted, far more often than men, many studies have shown an association between high hostility towards women and sexual aggression. Another factor can be an individual's rape myth acceptance or how much they justify sexual assault and place blame on the victim. There are also theories about men who prescribe to traditional gender roles, as well as attitudes that hypermasculine men display towards women that need further study for better understanding. Theories continued, prior sexual behavior. Some aspects of an individual's prior sexual behavior has been associated with perpetration of sexual offenses, such as early initiation of sex, impersonal attitudes about sex, promiscuity, and past sexual violence. Unsurprisingly, past sexual violence was most predictive of future sexual offenses. Research estimate that recidivism is between 14 and 68 percent for those who have already been sexually aggressive. It is important to note that this theory is also limited, and many researchers believe that past sexual behavior is only one component linked with other factors that might predict adult sexual offenses. Interpersonal relationships. Attachment theory was developed by John Bowlby and further developed by Mary Ainsworth. The main idea behind attachment theory is that an infant will develop bonds with their caregiver during their formative years that will continue to exist as a template for close relationships into their adult years. Secure attachment will give the child a sense of well-being, that they are safe, and that their caregiver is someone they can rely on. Insecure attachments are a di direct result of inconsistent or unpredictable behavior from their caregiver that manifests as either anxious or avoidant attachment. A handful of studies have empirically explored the relationship between sex offenders and attachment styles and found them more likely to be insecurely attached. From here forward, the research we will be presenting is all recent, beginning in 2021, and is mostly focused on community integration and what the effects of probation are for offenders after they are released. Most likely, individuals convicted of a serious sexual offense will receive a prison sentence or a suspended prison sentence to be served in the community in combination with a treatment or rehabilitation program tied to the nature of their offenses and the risk they pose. Rehabilitation is based on the principle that people can and want to change through a cognitive behavioral framework that uses strength-based approaches and pro-social behavior modeling. One of the main challenges in the community integration of people convicted of sexual offenses is articulating exactly what success looks like. For treatment to work, the offender must actively participate in identifying his or her risky behaviors and in developing coping strategies to address them. Community management policies are impacted by key performance indicators, KPIs, related to the criminal justice organizations, charities, and non-government organizations that must execute them. Generally, success is measured in terms of whether or not convicted people reoffend. This could be a problematic attempt at measuring success because someone can reoffend without getting caught, which means no conviction. Some questions that can be asked are, is there a better way of identifying risk, managing risk, or measuring risk? 
the integration of sex offenders back into the community is a difficult balancing act between risk management, public protection, and community relations. The containment approach has three major components. Intensive supervision of offenders, which includes frequent office contact, polygraph testing, field searches of offenders' homes, and verification of information obtained verbally from offenders. Treatment that emphasizes a cognitive behavioral and relapse prevention group therapy approach. A partnership between probation officers and treatment providers that includes frequent communication and sharing of relevant information on specific offenders. The likely rate that an offender will reoffend is between 10 and 16 percent. The Risk Pred Prediction Index, RPI for short, is an eight question prediction instrument used by federal probation officers to estimate or predict the likelihood of an offender reoffending during his or her period of supervision. Risk protection index scores range from zero to nine, with low scores representing a low risk of reoffending and high scores associated with a higher risk of reoffending. Characteristics of an offender are the factors primarily addressed on the RPI calculation worksheet. Some characteristics include employment at the start of supervision, history of illegal drug use, number of prior arrests, and whether a weapon was used in the commission of the current offense. As previously mentioned, housing restrictions placed on sexual offenders would pose a threat to community safety among other problems. These restrictions can cause issues with the re-entry of sexual offenders into the community since they will be faced with very few housing options, which can lead to homelessness. These restrictions can also lead to a higher risk of persistent criminal behavior. There was a survey done of 119 people, and about 79% believed it was acceptable to not let sexual offenders move back into their place of residence after conviction, especially if they lived near a park or school. 66% of people believed it was okay to prevent sexual offenders from living with supportive family members if it fell within the residency restriction law. Another 69% believed it was acceptable for a landlord to refuse to rent to a sexual offender. Well, that concludes our presentation. Hopefully it was informative and coherent. We do have a discussion planned. Obviously we can't partake in that here and now, but we can do it via the web. I'm not exactly sure what our question will be quite yet. My class partner is coming up with it probably as we speak, but I will place it here. And so that'll be a preview for the, the discussion. And where's the discussion? It is in Canvas, in the discussions section of our class page. So head over there, feel free to share your thoughts, respond to the question, respond to other students, however you feel, you feel like interacting, and uh, we'll see you there. Thank you.